If you are preparing for an examination involving bending stress of beams, make sure you understand three formulas. Number one is, of course, the formula for bending stress, which we call the flexure formula. Number two is the Hooke's law. And number three is the beam curvature. Good day, Mathalino. Again, this is Junvert. In this video, let us derive the formula for flexural stress of structural members subjected to bending. If you are new to this channel, consider subscribing. Before we start with the derivation of formula, we need to do some assumptions. This derivation is limited to the following conditions. Number 1. The beam is of constant cross-section and is initially straight. Number 2. The longitudinal axis, depicted as neutral axis, will not change in length during deformation. Number 3. All cross-sections of the beam remain plane and perpendicular to the longitudinal axis during deformation. Number 4. The material is homogeneous and obeys Hooke's law, and that the moduli of elasticity for tension and compression are equal. Number 5. The plane of loading must contain the principal axis of the cross-section and the load must be perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the beam. Number 6. Any deformation of the section within its own plane is neglected. The stress formula due to bending are based upon these restraints. With all this being established, we are now ready to derive the flexure formula. Due to the vertical load, the beam will deflect and the deformation is represented by this elastic curve. Note that our drawing is greatly exaggerated. The deformed beam can be represented by the neutral axis in the longitudinal direction. Let us consider a fiber of length AB in the longitudinal axis of the neutral plane. And at a distance y above AB, let us consider another fiber of the same length as AB and let us call it fiber CD. This portion of the beam in the deformed state can be assumed to be circular. Note that in general, this is not really circular. Each point in our elastic curve may have different center of curvature. But if we consider infinitesimal short length with central angle de theta, the difference in radii of curvature between the ends is negligible. For presentation purposes though, let us go back to this figure. This is the length AB in our deformed beam. Remember our assumption number 2 that this fiber does not change in length because it lies in the neutral surface. And this one is the fiber CD at a distance y above AB. For the sake of easy visualization, let us take the cross section to be rectangular. This is our neutral plane. And this is the plane at distance y above the neutral surface. Observe that our surfaces are flat before the deformation. After the loads are applied, the beam will curve upward. Because of the upward curvature, all fibers above the neutral plane are compressed, hence it shortened, while fibers below the neutral plane are stretched, hence it lengthened. Fibers that shortened were subjected to compressive stress, and fibers that lengthened were under tensile stress. Let us go back to our undeformed beam. May I reiterate that our neutral axis is actually a surface, and at the cross-section, we usually label it with NA in our drawing. Note that NA contains the centroid of our section. And from our assumption number 5, the principal axis of bending usually contains the axis of symmetry. And this is important because the principal axis contains the shear center of the section. We apply the load at this plane to prevent warping the section. Again, this is our fiber AB. And this is our fiber CD which is at distance y above AB. At the deformed state, this is AB and this is CD. With all this visualization in place, we will now dive deeper to the derivation. Assumption number 4 states that the material must obey 
Hooke's Law. In 1678, the English scientist Robert Hooke postulated that stress is proportional to strain. It has been proven to be true within the elastic region up to the proportional limit. The constant of proportionality is the slope of the straight line from O to P. We call it the modulus of elasticity or the Young's modulus. And it is denoted by E. In bending, we do not use sigma as symbol for stress. Instead, we prefer F subscript B. Recall that the strain epsilon is the ratio of deformation to length, or that is equal to delta over L. Note that initially, the lengths CD and AB are equal. But due to compression, CD has shortened by an amount AE. Therefore, strain is equal to AE over AB. AE can be assumed to be a circular arc of radius Y with center at point C. Therefore, AE is equal to Y times theta. And AB, of course, is equal to rho times theta. Cancel out rho, and we have this strain equal to Y over rho. Hence, FB is equal to E times Y over rho. Let us now consider the section of our beam. Note that although our example here is rectangular, the derivation of formula is irrespective to shape of the section. We can therefore use the formula to any cross-sectional shape. Observe that the stress distribution is linear in Y, and do we want to find the magnitude of the bending stress at this fiber? To do that, let DF be the differential force that causes FB to the fibers at Y. This force DF produces a differential moment dm at the neutral axis. The magnitude of this dm is equal to moment arm y times the force df. Note that force is equal to stress times the area. So we can replace df by fb times the differential area da, where df is acting. Substitute fb is equal to e times y over rho. dm now will become e over rho times y squared da. And let us accumulate all of the dms. To do that, we are going to integrate both sides of the equation. Recall from calculus that this quantity is called the moment of inertia of the section. After integration, our equation is now m is equal to e over rho times i. Rearrange! We have this equation, 1 over rho is equal to m over ei. Wow! Can you see that? We just wrote the reciprocal of the radius of the deformed beam. Are you familiar with this quantity? Do you recall something? If you've done watching my previous video, 1 over rho is the curvature. In that video, we derived the formula of curvature from the given equation of the curve. We have now in our disposal the mathematical expression of how the beam curve. But why use curvature instead of the radius of curvature? Watch out for our future videos to learn why curvature is more neat than radius of curvature when it comes to analysis of beams. This equation of FB can be rearranged for our purpose. Substitute m over ei for 1 over rho. Cancel out e. And we have the formula for bending stress at distance y from in a. fb is equal to my over i. Let us go back to our stress distribution. It is clear now why the distribution is linear. As you can see, the power of y in our equation is equal to 1. This equation shows that at y is equal to 0, or at the neutral axis, the bending stress is 0, and fb will increase linearly as we go away from na. This is the reason why the maximum bending stress will occur at the farthest fiber from na. 
and we use C to denote the distance from NA to the farthest fiber. For maximum bending stress in the section, the equation will become MC over I. And to find the maximum bending stress of the beam, of course, you also need to find which section of the beam is subjected to the largest moment. Therefore, for the entirety of the beam, the maximum bending stress will occur at the section that is subjected to maximum bending moment. And at that section, the farthest fiber from NA carries the full magnitude of FB maximum. With all these writings in front of us, let us talk about these three. The bending stress, the beam curvature, and the Hooke's law. If you include these three in your arsenal, you will position yourself at a better advantage of attacking problems involving this topic. Let us now focus on FB is equal to MY over I and that at a particular section, it is maximum when y is equal to c. It is also at our advantage to consider the flexure formula for rectangular section. Say we have a rectangle of width b and depth d. From the neutral axis, the farthest fiber is d over 2. The formula will become fb max is equal to m times d over 2 all over bd cube all over 12. That is the moment of inertia for the rectangular section, bd cube all over 12. And this equation will reduce to 6m all over bd squared. Note that this formula is only applicable at the topmost or at the bottommost part of the rectangular beam. A common misuse of this formula is using it at a rectangular section but not at the extreme fibers. If you are to find the stress, say at this fiber here, this is not applicable. You need to use the formula MY over I for this. When it comes to steel, engineers often use section modulus instead of moment of inertia. The reason of this is pretty obvious. When you see that the modulus of the section is equal to I over C. The larger the S, the more resistant is the material for bending. Going back to the stress distribution diagram, the two-dimensional drawing we have is actually a projection of this 3D distribution. And this is an interesting fact. The magnitude of the forces acting on the cross-section of the beam is equal to the volume of this stress diagram. The total compressive force, therefore, is the volume of this red diagram. And the total tension force is equal to the volume of this blue diagram. Note that by equilibrium condition, tension and compression cancels out. Which means that they are equal in magnitude but oppositely directed. These forces form into a couple. And the magnitude of this couple is equal to the moment perpendicular to the cross-section. And this moment is applied directly at the plane of principal axis of the section. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something. Have a good day. See you in our next video. Bye-bye!